Welcome back to History on a Hog. I'm your host, Captain Boz. Well, I still have mail to get out on the road this winter and do this. So, with all this time on my hands, I was encouraged by some friends to do another episode of Flying Stories on a different aircraft that I flew during my 40-year flying career. So on this episode of Flying Stories, I'll take a look at my time flying the U.S. Coast Guard's Aerial Interceptor and Search and Rescue Jet, the A-225 Guardian. During my career, I spent most of my time flying in the military first as an Army aviator, and then later as a Coast Guard Naval aviator. I made the switch because, frankly, I was really unhappy with the Army. They told me that it was time for me to stop flying and go do some time as a staff officer. Well, that didn't suit me. I wanted to keep flying. I had heard about a Coast Guard program where they were recruiting pilots from the other military services to fill their pilot needs. I decided to apply for that program and was selected. After completing two tours flying rescue helicopters, the Coast Guard gave me an opportunity to make a switch from helicopters to airplanes and specifically to jets. And so after 16 years of flying helicopters, I made that switch and transitioned into the HU-25 Guardian, the Coast Guard's equivalent of a fighter jet. And let me start out by saying, no one in the Coast Guard called this jet the Guardian. It was simply known as the Falcon. It's because the HU-25 airframe was based upon a highly versatile and successful French business jet, the Dassault Falcon 20. And the Falcon 20 design was directly influenced by a highly regarded and successful French naval fighter, the Dassault Mysterio. So as you can see, the HU-25 had a great pedigree. Like all Coast Guard aircraft, the HU-25 was a multi-purpose mission aircraft. Its missions included search and rescue, maritime law enforcement, such as migrant and drug interdiction, ocean environmental protection, such as monitoring oil spills and pollution on the world's oceans, and military readiness, which included counterterrorism operations, but not only against Islamic terrorism, but also against illegal South American drug cartels. Remember, the Coast Guard, in addition to being the smallest of the U.S. Armed Forces, is a humanitarian rescue service, and it is also a U.S. federal law enforcement agency, like the FBI, responsible to enforce United States and United Nations maritime laws. The Coast Guard wears a lot of hats for being such a small organization. In fact, it is so small that the New York City Police Department has more personnel than the entire U.S. Coast Guard. Think about that for a minute. So let me be clear. The HU-25 was a working mission jet. Inside, it was a very high-tech surveillance aircraft with several sophisticated sensors. Sensors that were used to go look for bad guys. The flight crew complement consisted of five crew members the pilot or aircraft commander, the co-pilot, the sensor surveillance operator who operated and monitored all the electronic sensors and radar at their specially designed workstation in the rear of the aircraft, the aircraft flight mechanic who doubled as the drop master, the crew member responsible for rigging and delivering the rescue equipment, and lastly, the observer who performed the duties of a dedicated visual lookout and assisted the dropmaster with rigging the rescue gear. 
both the flight mechanic and observer were the dedicated visual scanners when we were in searching mode. They each looked out of their respective specially designed oversized windows, using nothing but their eyeballs during the day and using night vision goggles at night. The most important feature of the Falcon jet was first and foremost its dash speed or response speed. We could respond incredibly fast to a maritime law enforcement situation or a search and rescue incident that was developing, certainly much faster than in the past when we only had slower propeller airplanes. In addition to these radars, the HU-25 had an awesome day optical camera that was mounted under the fuselage. Its zoom feature alone was exceptional, able to clearly image a target at extreme long distances. This feature alone saved us a tremendous amount of time in identifying targets. Additionally, the camera pod also possessed a separate night vision infrared camera, which was used to detect a target's heat signature during searches at night or in poor weather conditions, like fog. You know, one of the biggest questions that I'm frequently asked about the Falcon is, how do you rescue anyone from a jet? Well, that's a damn good question. And the answer is, do you remember the ending of that James Bond movie, Thunderball? Let me remind you. No, that's not what we did. But I wish we did. Sure looks like a lot of fun. We had a fairly large drop hatch that was built right into the floor. And when you opened it, you could see down straight through it and see the surface of the water whizzing by. We had all kinds of rescue equipment on board to deal with all kinds of emergency situations that we might encounter. Our kits included survival rafts, packages of food, water, and radios, and dewatering pumps to be used to control flooding in a sinking ship. These kits would be hooked up and then dropped through the floor hatch and hopefully be delivered to whatever the distress was, whether it be to a ship, a boat, or a person in the water. It was the drop master's job to rig the appropriate survival equipment package making sure to attach a parachute to it. And then, he'd move it over the hatch and be prepared to release it. Oh, by the way, that's me up front in the cockpit, flying this mission. We up front would then circle around the target and descend to a very low altitude. I'm talking low, between 75 to 100 feet. Remember, we are a jet. At this altitude, there was no room for error. It was thrilling and fun, but extremely dangerous. Especially dangerous when flying this low at night. We would also be slowing down, way down, cutting our speed to just above our stall speed. We would then line up on the target, and at a computed point, we would drop the survival equipment to them. Once we had the rescue situation stabilized, we would either direct in a Coast Guard helicopter that was on its way, or if we were outside the range of the helicopters, we would find the closest surface ship in the area, whether it be freighters, cruise ships, or some rich guy's yacht, whatever ship that was nearby. Then we'd get a hold of them on the radio, on an emergency frequency that all mariners monitor, and then divert them the boat or person in distress. Then we would have them do the actual rescue. And that is how we rescue people from a jet. We had a certain model of the Falcon, the HU 25C model, that was specifically designed with additional sensors to be used as an air interceptor. 
One of our more exciting law enforcement missions was when we were flying patrol over the Caribbean, chasing down drug smuggling go fast boats that were transporting illegal drugs into South Florida. We'd first detect them on radar, and then get them on the camera. And then we'd start flying circles overhead, keeping out of sight, keeping an eye on them to see where they were going. We would then get on the radio and coordinate an intercept with our surface forces, usually one of our cutters, and have them arrested. This process worked really well, and we caught a lot of bad guys this way. The C-Model Falcon also had an APG-66 air-to-air -air acquisition and attack radar system. That's the same radar system used by the U.S. Air Force F-16 fighters to target and shoot down enemy jets with air-to-air -air missiles. We'd use that radar to conduct day and night patrols over the Caribbean, searching for and tracking drug smuggling aircraft hauling cocaine to the U.S like in that recent Tom Cruise movie, American Made. A couple of memorable stories comes to mind during the years that I flew the Falcon out of Miami, Florida. On one particular Caribbean law enforcement night patrol, we detected and began to track a suspicious air target just south of Jamaica. It was off the normal airliner airways and was acting just like a smuggler. So using our radar and night vision goggles, we slowly crept up behind it to within 100 feet of its tail so that we could visually identify it and get its tail number. That was our standard procedure. We'd had hopes that we had bagged a smuggler, but as we crept closer, it became apparent that we had just intercepted an Air Jamaica Boeing 737 passenger jet, its logo brightly lit on its tail. It was just an airline, off course, full of tourists, and not squawking a proper aircraft identification transponder code. So we broke it off. No harm, no foul. But the pilots and passengers on board had no clue that we were there, just a hundred feet off the tail, and we were there for 20 minutes or so. Think of that on your next flight to a Caribbean destination. Maybe now on future flights, you'll take a peek back and see if there's anybody behind the airplane. And before I finish, let me recount one last story when I was stationed out of Miami, Florida. It involves NASA. You see, NASA would request the assistance of the U.S. Coast Guard for every U.S. space shuttle launch out of the Kennedy Space Center. They'd asked us to do three specific things. First, provide oceanside security of the Kennedy Space Center. Keep away all the recreational boats and tourists from the launch facilities. Second, it asked us to conduct a pre-launch surface sweep of the ocean range and clear out any surface vessels that might be in the booster recovery area. And third, if necessary, provide a search and rescue capability in case the shuttle went down in the ocean after a launch abort. A shuttle support mission would start about three hours prior to every launch. We would depart Miami and then fly up the east coast of Florida to Cape Canaveral. Then proceed offshore and start sweeping the oceanic range area and the solid rocket booster recovery zone. Once the designated area had been cleared, we had to radio directly to the launch control director and announce that the ocean range had been cleared of all targets. You see, the shuttle couldn't launch until they received this report from us. But our mission wasn't over yet. We would then land and refuel at Patrick Air Force Base, which sat right next to Cape Canaveral. And we would refuel with our engines running, and then taxi towards the end of the runway and stand by. We were normally turned towards the shuttle launch pad, so when the shuttle lit off, we would witness the launch until the shuttle was out of sight, all the time monitoring the launch director's radio frequency. In the unlikely event of a launch abort with a shuttle ocean ditching, 
Our job was to immediately take off and first, locate the shuttle crash site, second, assume command of the on-scene recovery effort, and third, direct other Coast Guard and Department of Defense rescue forces to the crash site to render assistance. I had the privilege to take part in six space shuttle launches. Luckily, all six launches that I was involved with were uneventful. And like most of the military aircraft that I flew during my career, the HU-25 is now a museum piece, retired in 2014 and relegated to museums and memorials. They were replaced by turboprops, the HC-144 Alpha Ocean Century. And although the HU-25 and I were retired from the Coast Guard long ago, it wouldn't be the last time that I would get a chance to fly her. As fate would have it, I would fly her again, years later, during my career as a research test pilot. In fact, after 40 years of flying military, airline, and research test flying, I would fly my very last professional flight in the HU-25. So, she's always gonna be something special to me. Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed the episode. You know, the HU-25 is a great aircraft, and I felt privileged to fly her. Anyways, I'll probably do more of these episodes, so keep an eye out. And I hope to see you again on another episode of History on a Hog.